We're live on Facebook. Hello, 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 and welcome to For Peck's Sake Marketing Adventures with Carmel. Um, this is where we bring you tips, tricks, and insight into how to market your business or stuff ups that we've done on the way to market our business. And also, I bring you some amazing people to interview that have had some of the problems that you've had too and how they've got over them. So for today, we have the amazing Dave Denver, who I'll introduce in just a moment. So if you're watching us on Facebook, make sure you put a comment underneath. And we'll make sure that Dave puts his um, details in so you can hang contact him or connect with him. But if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button so that you can be alerted every time we bring you more and more of these insights. So Dave, welcome, welcome, welcome to today's show. Good afternoon, my pleasure. It's awesome to have you here. So, Dave, let me introduce you a little bit, and then I'll get you to introduce yourself a bit more. So, Dave, I've known, gosh, for many, many years now. Dave, I don't even know how many years I've known you. Well, eight, <laughs> no, eight, nine, I don't know, I've lost count. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a while. So, Dave, it's a business breakthrough specialist look that didn't quite come off my tongue um, as I wanted it to and I know that Dave is going to share some stuff with us and particularly about the topic of burnout which has been a hot topic lately and um, he helps businesses generate more clients more sales and increase their overall revenue and profit and I know that Dave will share with us his background as well because um, I'll let you tell the story more about the burnout side of it um, and you have a strong grounding in um, business and financial services, which never sounds kind of very sexy at first. It's like I'm the numbers guy, but you've brought it into business now in a way that actually helps support people find that um, money that's kind of slipping through the cracks as well in their business. So over to you, Dave. Um, just give us a little bit of background of who Dave is and how he's come to where he is in business right now. And then we get into some of the other nitty gritty. Wow. <laughs> um, so look, I've been in financial services for, in one way, shape or form, 22, 23 years now, uh, or in and around that industry. And it's kind of an industry that found me. I didn't go looking for it. I was, um, uh, you know, I wanted to be a pilot or an engineer and somehow I ended up in finance and banking, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, was was it because of a family member or anything that was in there? Like, how did it find you when you say it uh, found you? Well, so I grew up in a military family, so you know it was um uh you know I, I thought I was going to be a pilot in the air force. That was as far back as I can remember. That's it was either a pilot in the navy or the air force, and just I guess life happens, things change, and you know you you um I guess as you you get older you mature and you think that no that's really not what I want to do. And I, I think I was probably going through the motions of, of thinking that that was, you know, my dad was in the Navy, my father's father was in the Navy. So it was yeah. kind of, this, you know, I guess as a kid growing up, you, you, you know, nobody ever expected it of me, but they're the things that, you know, that the stories that you tell yourself in your yeah. head. So, yeah. um, so I thought that that's what I'd do. And then when I sort of finished high school, I realised that, oh, no one's actually got this expectation of me, despite right up through to year 12 exams. That's what I thought I was going to do. So... And then, yeah, things changed. Um, I, I was actually uh, an athlete for, for quite a period of time there in um, uh, doing triathlon and rugby league. And met my wife, who's also an, an athlete. She's a, she was a, gym, a gymnast. Uh, and, you know, we just had a love of life before kids still have a love of life, but it's different with kids. You had to, <laughs> and, you had to put that in there. <laughs> yeah, and we found ourselves... Um, over in Canberra, Jenny was working at the Institute of Sport over there with the Women's Gymnastics Program. And when she fell pregnant, it was always the deal that would come back home to Perth. She's from Perth. My parents were in Perth. And it seemed like the place to come back to. And it was in Canberra where I got introduced to, the, I guess, the financial services, the, the bigger picture of the industry. Um, and then it was, you know, uh, and I was in retail before that, so retail and the financial services. Before that, I actually worked in the casino industry for five and a bit years. Um, so I had exposure to all these different things. And um, and then, yeah, we're in Perth. And we moved back to Perth. And I thought, what am I going to do? And, um, you know, I was good with numbers, good with understanding, um, you know, calculations, risk management and so forth. And that was the introduction into into the insurance industry, which comes under the financial services arena. And then I moved more into 
into lending and corporate. Um, so you corporate were an lending. insurance man, were you? <laughs> yeah, well, more not so not so much selling insurance, more um, understanding risk on what goes to to make up a policy and so forth. Um, right. So okay. you, when you, yeah, so it's kind of the behind the scenes, and then into retail, and then it was it was through that um, that opened the door into finance, understanding risk and finance, and then training finance managers and yeah, just a whole heap of things in a, in a really what felt like a really short compressed time frame, but you know reliving through it it was just like it was it was always that the door would open to here's the next step here's the next step and I just yeah. kept stepping through the doors yeah and then eventually we set up our own practice in in finance broking uh in yeah. the in the residential mortgage and um you know investment arena and obviously the automotive and commercial finance and then I pursued further studies to become a, a financial planner and I'm like a square peg in a round hole in a financial planning room. I'm, I just, <laughs> I, I, it's one of those things that I kind of, no, I, I was good at it, but I, it wasn't my passion, you know? It was, yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, that, that's because I wanted you to tell it in your way, because I know, I know you and you don't strike me as what I would perceive as the really serious financial planner kind of numbers guy either. Uh, uh, definitely no. not. <laughs> And, and, and it was it was that back end of that um, you know nearly fifteen years of building your own businesses. You know we had we had a financial finance breaking business, a financial planning practice. Um, we had a a locum business as well, where we had uh, consulting staff out in out in the marketplace with forty odd staff members. So it was you know it was like a circus act. I was juggling balls all the time and. And over a period of time, it was everybody, you know, the noise was always there and you're servicing everything that was yelling and screaming at you. And over time, you start to neglect your own needs, your own health and so forth. And then you you wake up one day, a dribbling mess, can't decide which pair of socks you want to put on. And literally, that was the, you know, the, the starting point for me. And I'd been giving so much to everybody else that I was neglecting my own health and my own needs and, and my yeah. relationship and my, you know, my kids were missing yeah, out. Yeah, it all kind of cascades down. And you're so right that I love how you put it that it's all the noise. So you're running around going answer, 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 answer. But something has to give, which was you. So like it's fascinating when you think of it. And I'm sure even I find when people ask me questions and I say the stuff out loud, I go, oh, my God. I've gone from somebody that was potentially going to be in the Navy to going into retail, to going into being an athlete, to do all this different stuff to end up as in, you know, figures. And I know you've gone beyond that as well. So, like, it's yeah. quite interesting. But I love the term you use where the doors just kept opening and I just kept stepping through them. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I, yeah. I probably didn't realise at the time, I mean, a lot of those, decisions that, that I was doing that that's you know that's the luxury of hindsight and maturity yeah. to go I just kept doing it but that was I you know I guess from a sporting perspective is you you you've sometimes you just got to keep taking steps just keep you know it's just one more yeah. just one more just one more uh, but with all that and this is where I, I understand now is with all that is it's great to keep taking steps but you've also got to take care of you in the journey yeah. as well yeah. otherwise otherwise you, you you just you have nothing left to give Absolutely. And what I um, was going to say about that is quite often, like you said, you had an assumption that this is what you were going to do, that you were going to be a pilot or something. I think sometimes people have assumptions of either other people's expectations or they just plod along and they keep taking the steps, but not necessarily the steps that actually improve them. They just keep taking the steps because that's what somebody has told them or that's what society has told them. And they often end up in a much worse place than yourself rather than at least you um, got some work and business out of it. Some people just take the steps. We used to have a saying that was um, people were quite often promoted to their own incompetence. Oh, and that's yeah. what it was, yeah. Uh, especially in the hospitality industry, we had yeah. the best waitress in the place and she would be promoted to supervisor or manager and the place would go to hell in a freaking handbasket because she didn't actually have the people skills. She did so she was promoted and then wasn't given the support and the people training in it. But she kept stepping through because that's what people expected. You're very good at what you do. You must be ready to go up. So I think it can be detrimental sometimes. Look, I think that you know, obviously, you and I work in the world of working with a lot of business owners as well, and and you see it time and time again that 
that the hierarchy identifies that person and go, man, she is a brilliant waitress. She's going to be our next manager. And they've never actually stopped to identify that she doesn't have manage, the manager the skills. You know, they haven't yeah. invested in, 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 in that particular person's part of their journey yet to give them the skills that they need. It's almost this assumption of, oh, if you're good at that, then you must be good at being able to show other people mm. how come you're good at it. Mm. And it's yeah. not necessarily the case. Yeah. No, and that was part of my journey was like, because I became a bit more assertive at one stage I wasn't, believe it or not. Um, and they'd say, oh, you can do this, you can do this. And by pure determination and grit, and although it was a lot of the internal dialogue of I can't do this, they're going to wake up one day and realize oh, I can't do this. And um, I just kept persevering and I just kept working through it because I had a family to feed and I had a whatever, whatever. Mm. But the training wasn't there, which kind of, I think, bore the passion that when I first started a business was about team building and building leaders because I knew that they didn't have them and they hadn't given them that those tools. So yeah. um, when you talk about then this this idea of burnout and, and it's, I've had a few conversations around this and vulnerability. Mm. So you said like you basically woke up one day and you didn't know what pair of socks to put on. Was there a catalyst to that? Was it at a certain time? I, I think it was... It was, in you know, again, looking back with hindsight, in the moment, I couldn't see how deep in the hole I was. I, I yeah. and, and you're also in, well, I, myself in particular, I was in that state of blame. It's everybody else's fault. If they could just leave me alone for five minutes, I'd get this sorted. And and not realising that what actually, what actually happens, and it's a great thing to look back in hindsight, that you can see that you, you make one shitty decision and then a day later, a week later, a month later, whatever it is, you're now at another crossroads and you've got to make another decision. But what you're trying to do is make up for the shitty decision you made previously. So you make another shitty decision under pressure on top of the previous yeah. shitty decision. And then, you know, it snowballs down the track. And so this was, you know, like it was, it wasn't, it wasn't a day or a week. It was years, you know, it was years yeah. of just um, constant pressure and just unrelenting wave after wave just kept, kept pounding you. And then, you, you know, you I, from from my perspective, it's like running a marathon and which is forty two kilometer you know run, and and I'm at the forty kilometer mark going. I, I just got nothing left. You know, yeah. that was that was the, the you know, in, in business is a marathon. Man, I just haven't I learned that over the last twenty five years. <laughs> you know, it is, it is a. It Let's is start a, your own business because it would be great. It's like nobody do uh, tell me all the hard work there was in it. But tell absolutely. me, tell me this though, and I'm curious. So how did it? How did you know you were at the burnout stage? Because I hear what you're saying. And as I said, for me, it was, I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Again, benefit of hindsight, if I realized it's holy guacamole, some of the stuff that was happening or going on or the decisions I made, I should have stopped. I should have taken a break, but I didn't. I had to roof over the head. I had to feed my three children. I had to make sure this was all right. And they were going to find out I couldn't do the job anyway. But there comes a point that something changes. What was that point that eventually you went, shit, this is what's happening for you? So I, I was still in denial. I, th I still thought that it was everyone else's fault around me, not, not me. But yeah. a, a, a friend that had been, um, an industry colleague probably the right way to put it, had could see the signs who would previously been through a similar sort of thing themselves and known other people and they could see the signs and, and he just sat me down one day and said mate you need some help and you know and i said yeah i know if i wanted to leave me alone i'll be right he goes no no not, you actually need some professional help oh, and wow. and he literally just bung me in the car and took me to the to a doctor and said you just sit down and have a chat to the doctor. I said, what about? He says, mate, you need some help. Talk to the doctor. So, And I'm actually sitting in this doctor's surgery, almost having a uh, having a, a dialogue. It wasn't heated or anything. Just saying, mate reckons I'm having a billion here. He's talking about depression and anxiety. I think he's nuts. And she's, you know, 20 minutes later, she's going, you definitely have depression and anxiety issues. You need to go and see a psychiatrist, a psychologist. And so that was the, and I'm still in denial. I'm still going, I can't believe a word that's coming out of your mouth. Um, then fast forward about another six weeks, and then I just had a I had a meltdown one day, just just literally having a meltdown, and um, there was um, I can't think of the right name for it, but it, like basically like healthcare nurses and stuff, you know, on, on the scene, and um, some was it a psychotic episode. Shall we say? Oh no, not no, it wasn't no. that. It was, it was just it was it was 
it was just it was like shut down. It was just that was just the right. just absolutely okay. like shut down. And and um, you know, and and my language was one of uh, people were thinking that I was about to self harm and stuff like that. And and right. it's gone through okay. all that, right? Yeah. And I and I don't distinctly remember that that was my my headspace on that particular day. But there must have been enough going on for people yeah. around me to go, you know what, this is your you've you've gone that next level. Let's get you some help. No. And you know, there was police, healthcare workers, the whole lot. And and that whole forty eight hours is just a blur. I literally woke up in a healthcare facility and spent the next two weeks there just kind of just unwinding. And mm. and it took it probably took a good seven or eight days for me to have that point where I was relaxed enough to actually have a conversation without getting my back up. It was it was a oh man, what a wake up call. So yeah, it was mm. it wasn't a but it, and here's the thing, it then took it then took years, like literally years to go as much as I did all the work, work on all the psychs and all the personal development stuff that you do. The, the the emotion that I've landed on is shame. There was so much shame attached to that in terms of how could this happen to me? I like you know I'm. I was lit I literally wrote shame down here to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah. Well, it took it took me a long time to land on that word. I get, like embarrassment wasn't it, but it was shame. Yeah. It was this feeling of everybody that I'd let down and so forth, and and, and myself. And uh, it took a long like a lot of counselling and a lot of work to land to mm. finally even realise that that was in my emotional spectrum that that's where I was. You know, because I had I had happy, neutral, and sad. That's all I had in my emotional yeah. spectrum. Yeah. 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 And fact, number one, I want to, first of all, thank you so much for being so open about it. Sometimes people try and hide it because they still have shame around it and everything. Uh, but I think it's really important to have these conversations because people are going through this stuff and they think there's something wrong with them and they're feeling shame and they're feeling upset. And I think it's important to say, well, you're not alone. It is OK. And it's OK to ask for help, too. But what I find fascinating is that you were so deep in that denial of like even the fact you went to the doctor yeah. and go I don't actually know why I'm here but he told me I should come do you think now in hindsight that the reason you didn't say to your mate get stuffed I'm not going that you actually followed his advice was maybe was there something there that knew something wasn't quite right um no look it was it was it was the way he said it. Like the the, the it was just it, I was still in denial. Like I'm still going. I really don't understand what you're talking about. But it was the mate. If you don't get some help, you're not going to have a marriage. You know that, that was the yeah. that, and, and and I and that was kind of the the slap in the face bit of going. What are you on about? Like what what, what are you talking about? I'm in a, we're fine, and and I couldn't. You know I couldn't see at the time that the impact that that was having on Jen. You know she she mm. is the most. Oh, you know, one of the toughest women I know in, in, is is probably the best way yeah. to put it. If, if the roles were reversed, I don't know that I would have been able to help her the way she helped me. Right. Put, it, put it that way, right. like that, that. That and I and that's I. Oh, I I, don't, I, don't, I I still don't have the language around it to to express the gratitude that I have for that. I sometimes I just sit there and I just it's just it's just that warm feeling of wow for someone to. To, you know, to, to drag someone to hell and back through what I went through. Because yeah. I, I, again, I was just that was an idle type scenario. Mm. But that was, you know, I, the, the interesting thing about the shame factor, Carmel, is you know, where I've arrived now is I'm actually happy to talk about it because if I had have had someone been able to talk to me the way I can now with others and have that experience to go, man, this is what's going to happen, and this is all the things that you need to look out for. Yeah. Because now, if I if I went through that journey and all the stress and all the pain, if I can just go, if I've gone through that just to help one other person on the planet, then it's yeah. all worth it. And yeah. if I can help 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, well, then even better. But if this is yeah. that one person that goes, you know what, you got a young family, taking yourself out actually doesn't make the problem go away for them. It no. just passes it on to them. So, yeah. so how about we how about we take some ownership, take some responsibility, and you know, I, I'll help you through the process so that your kids still have a father in the in their mm. life. That's, that's beautiful. Where, that's where I'm. Yeah. So, from the time you went to the doctors to the time you actually had that break, if you like, um, how like was that a big timeline or was it kind of on a oh time? six to eight weeks, I think, in terms oh, of that. Right. Then, okay. But then, so that whole process was then okay. Well, I now need to. You know, I needed to stand down as the the, the director of businesses and stuff.
stuff and Jenny took over everything because I, you know, I, I couldn't even figure out which pair of socks I was going to go on, let alone dealing with multi-million dollar portfolios and that sort of stuff. I Literally, that was the reality check yeah. right there and then. But here's me, you know, <laughs> ever, ever the optimist. I thought, oh, well, give me, you know, give me two months off. I'll be right and we'll come back into it. Two months was two years. That was the recovery that I actually needed. That, you wow. know, and, and, and then it was, it actually took me two years to realise that I don't want to be in the financial planning game anymore. Mm. I, I I might have been good at it, but it's it, I, I didn't have the passion for it. It's not really yeah. what I wanted to do. I landed there by default. Um, but what I did do is I love, you know, in, in the reflections and all the things work that I did is I, helping business owners, like the clients that I had that were business owners, as opposed to, say, mums and dads on wages, it's because it's a different yeah. conversation and, and there's no disrespect to one party or the other. But helping people succeed in business was really what floated my boat, yeah. and that was and it was actually Jen that said, "Well, why don't you move into business coaching? You know, all the financial modelling and business running and the understanding that you have is only going to help you know tens and yeah. hundreds, hundreds of people." So it's and like so, you brought them all together. Th- that's it, and I saw yeah. the experience that I've had has done that. So that then you know that was another um, down another rabbit hole of education again, and just and it was like you know, and you go through all those emotions of. I don't know what I'm doing. Just be, okay, like we'll talk about it. Stuff. Just because I did it doesn't make me good at teaching somebody else. But you know, I, I've been coaching, I guess, sports since I was 18 or 19. So I certainly have a, a skill set to teach. Um, it just took me a long time to still bury that shame of why am yeah. I here, and then own that to then go forward with it. Yeah, and and I like where you say bury the shame. I think shame is something that. A, isn't talked about a lot. And B, uh, 80 to 90% of people that I know have it at some way, shape or form in their life. They've had it at some time. They feel it, whether it's rightfully felt or not, they feel they're not good enough. They feel they're whatever, but they feel shame because they can't meet somebody else's expectations a lot. There's a lot. And it's a little bit the same as there's a grief I believe as well, that goes with it. So grief and shame are quite often hand in hand. You grieve the person you thought you were, or you grieve the person that you thought you were to help those people. You know, if it's a family and that sort of thing. Definitely. Well, there's a whole, um, uh, like an identity crisis as well, because my whole world was wrapped up in the business, the practice. And so all of a sudden I'm not there, you know, and I'm, I'm, and and so, so the whole, when I say bury it, like, I think, I should probably re- clarify that because I think that's where people don't deal with shame, where they keep trying to suppress it. They put it, yeah. you know, they, they 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 want it to go away or sweep it under the carpet, so to speak. It's when we it's when we actually step into that place where we go, you know, that door opens and we go, you know what, I'm going to own this warts and all. Yeah, yeah, it was unpleasant, yeah. you know what, but yeah. I've had some fantastic um, learning opportunities as a result of it that get, puts me in a position where I can perhaps impact someone's life. That somebody that hasn't gone through this. He's yes. not going to understand where they're going through. And yeah, and if you were to say, and look, I, I'm sorry that you went through that, and and people we know uh, are skirting on the edges of it quite a, a lot of the time. They might not yeah. go as far as you've gone, but the signs are there. They're skirting on the edge of it. So, what would you attribute to being the top three things that once you got there, what were the top kind of three things that helped you get back out of it that have brought you to kind of where you are now? What, what was that? Oh, a lot of honest conversations with self. That was, yeah, yeah that was the, the, the starting point. And being able to... Uh, so when you say, sorry, Shindra, when you say honest conversations with self, so I just want to dig a tiny little bit because... Quite often we we talk about that and I have an intellectualized idea of what you mean. But I know sometimes people say to me, what do you mean honest conversation with yourself? I don't talk with myself. So when you say honest conversation with yourself, how do you mean? So it was, was, I guess it was admitting things such as I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to be yeah. all knowing. You know, actually saying, you know what, that's a great question. I actually don't understand the answer to that. As opposed to holding to this position where, man, you're a um, you're a business coach. Surely you should know this. You know what? Yeah. The more I help people, the more I realise how how bloody little I do know. You know? Little corner, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. Exactly. And that's that's the whole fun and the adventure now, because you go, you know, I haven't come across this before. Let's figure it out together. Because I don't have to know all the answers, but 
I do have, I, what I do know is the models and the methods to actually get us to the other side where we yeah. both may have to learn in that process. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, so that those honest conversations are being real with yourself to go, you know what, I, I actually don't know much about that. Um, or, oh, hang on, there's some emotion there, but I can't, I don't have a name for that. I don't know what yeah. that emotion and is. It's, I, I and it's okay. Yeah, I need to, I need to go, you know, something between neutral and happy, there, there is a little bit in there. You know, and then where's love? Is it the other side of happy? Is it before happy? It, it's, you know, where's, where's like, where's friendship? Where's, where's intimacy? Mm-hmm. Uh, all those things were just words. I, I didn't know what the what the feeling was in, in right. that. So it was a lot of work in those uh, building building the emotional spectrum to then be able to fill in the gaps that I've neglected for so long. Mm, mm. And um, I would imagine um, asking for help, like reaching out, as you say, having honest conversations with yourself, but having honest conversations with other people, would that be? Yeah, yeah, asking for help was a big one. Um, yeah. man. And, and, and look, there's still parts of me that still has that stuff. It's just stuff. And no, I want to work this one out myself. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so, yeah. but, but now, as I catch myself doing it and I can laugh at myself and go, yes. oh, yeah. I've, I've, I've had a crack at this for you know a reasonable period of time. Obviously, I'm not getting the results that I want. Who do I know that might have some experience in this place? And that's yeah. so there's, there's a bit of fun with that. So it's catching yourself out as well and being, yeah. you know, being, being still holding yourself accountable, but being fallible being realize that i am a human you know i don't i don't you're not born with the manual that says no. you know, now you know everything <laughs> exactly right so tell us now what like because of all that i'm sure there's some different strategies that you have in place to to keep yourself in that look people say life balance i don't believe there's balance there's always a bit that way and a bit this way that's okay but in general overall it kind of balances out in some way shape or form how do you keep yourself in check now to make sure that you don't go down that road again? Yeah, well, you nearly said it. I was going to pick you up on something because I often hear people talk about that work-life balance. And yeah. for me, I think it's a silly thing to, to actually say because it, it suggests that you can only have one or the other. You can only be doing work or you can only be doing life. The reality is, is we're always doing life and our life is now made up of multiple parts. Yeah. And, and I use a concept called the life wheel. So I have, you know, work, occupation, business in there. I have yeah. the, the financial house. I, I look at um, uh, my intimate relationship with my, with my wife. I have, you know, you look at the, the depth of your relationship with your kids, with your family, with your, you know, your, your, your parents, your extended friends. Um, there's, there's, um, uh, hobbies and interests. Uh, there's community. There's uh, personal development. So I now every quarter I basically do a review of uh, yeah. the life wheel type process, and I'm scoring myself. Here's the funny thing, though. Like if you if you'd asked me, it's, it's like the journey is like climbing up a mountain, and the higher you go up the mountain, the better the view. So you can now yeah. see you can now see things that you couldn't see when you were at the yes, bottom of the mountain. Yes, yes, so when you so when you you're at you know at the bottom of the mountain, you might go, my relationships are nine out of ten, right? But now I'd sit down and go, it's a five out of ten. Now it's not that the relationships got any worse. I've just got so much more knowledge and sight now to go, wow, a ten could be that. You know, yes. once upon a once upon a time I could only see this far. So yeah. I was you know just a step away, going, hey, I'm there. But now that I know that I'm. I'm so much further. There's so much more to go. Yeah. I, I've got I've got more to achieve in that area. Yeah, you have to have a reference point for it because if you don't know, you don't know. So if your previous nine you've achieved and you can see so much more potential, you're going, hang on, no, that's not. I remember doing the life wheel exercise myself many years ago and I had one of the most buckety wheels ever. <laughs> so it was all lopsided, yeah, pretty much. So tell us what are some of the things that you implement for yourself in a self-care way now? Uh, so I, I make sure that I'm looking at the different domains of my life and, I, and I'm putting time, effort and energy each week in, into that. Yeah. Um, you know, and it could be as simple as, uh, you know, say in the relationship space. And I think this is a, a big thing for business is your business tends to become your total focus and you forget all these other aspects of your life like you've you've got a wife you've got kids you've got you've got community yeah. responsibilities uh, so it's about making sure you have time into your, into your, your diary so each so i do a review and preview for my week every every 
Sunday and I'll just review the week that has gone. It gives me a chance to sweep the week and go, damn, all those, there's a couple of things there that I've jotted down that I need to get through that I've, that I've missed. They now get scheduled as priorities for the week coming ahead. And I also look at the, um, so the, I actually use a system called the Full Focus Planner and it literally just takes you through that process. Um, and you can you know, Google Full Focus Planner and, and have, go down the rabbit hole with that one yourself. But it's a system that I've used now for about two and a half years yeah. Uh, so it, you've said that your strength in systems and numbers and things like that, it sounds like you've used some of that skill, which is very analytical skill, to move into a thing to support you so that you can have fun, the other part of you. So you put in some structure to, you know, go through your focus to build stuff up. Well, I used to be fly by the seat of my pants and it was too hard. You're not locking me yeah. into a routine and whatnot. You know, I'll just do whatever feels right. And the thing is, is routine actually gives you so much more freedom. Yeah? And, oh, and so yeah. it's counterintuitive. You would think, no, you're not locking me into all that. I like the freedom and flexibility. But when you've actually got systems in place and you get to your free time, part of your week, your day or whatever it is that you're doing, you've got so much more bandwidth yeah. to enjoy that because you've taken care of the other crap. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I. To it's taken me a long time to get there, but I totally agree with that. I so, don't. I don't think we ever arrived, Carmel, either. I think it's a work uh, in progress for life. I think, and that's, you know, you know. that's one of the things I had to learn because I, in my previous life, in hospitality, was a get that done, get that done, get that done, and now you working for yourself or growing your business, the list just never stops. It's not a tick tick and everything's done. And it doesn't not stop in a bad way. It's just because you're always growing and evolving. But you have to be strict with yourself to go, no, I'm switching off from that and going here. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, also tell us what it is that you're doing now and how that um, the business is growing from now. So I moved into the, the realms of... of business development is that was kind of where my headspace was you know business yeah. coaching business development uh and the, the biggest thing for me was being able to demonstrate uh right off the bat that, that we can make it you know working together we can make a financial impact and, and i see it time and time again with other coaches it's a well let's have a discussion let's just see where things are at and there's no there's no quantitative or qualitative measures in place so for me it was yeah. you know that, that was the financial plan of brain kicking in there and go well well, what are we going to work on? So you go, now we can actually have a look at, there's actually 12 levers that we work across um, from a from what I call a jump start, which is our initial assessment. And they cover things like, you know, cost bundling, um, uh, looking at your price points, your joint venture processes, your, your um, you know, have you got things like a market dominating, market dominating position or a unique selling proposition in place? And so it's all these different things that yeah. build on that. So what we can actually do is do an analysis where we look at it and go, well, let's pick these top areas that are relevant for your particular style of business. And if we could make 1% improvements, 2% improvements, 5% improvements in that one area alone, what's the financial impact on your business? Yeah. So, so it's still the finances, but so much more. You're still, yeah. at the end of the day, why are you in business? Because you want to you need to make a buck. <laughs> yeah. Well, and all the, all the human behavior stuff and analysis comes behind that so once we actually look at it and go okay well we're going to look at um building a joint venture program for your particular yeah. business whatever it might be you know that we, we, we sell widgets and then you then with that particular business owner they go no no i don't want to work with other people so then there comes the opportunity to go okay well let's have a look at why you've got some resistance there it might be that they've been burnt in the past uh, yeah. they might they might have some fear of being found out that they're not as good as what they think they are it, it, all that stuff yeah. comes up so that yeah. and that's and that's where we drill down and we actually do the work. And sometimes it can just be one topic out of the 12. We can spend two, three months just trying to bed that in because we yeah. know that if we can get this lever to an optimum within their business, it could have a $100,000, $200,000 improvement on their business. Yeah, absolutely. And that the thing to always remember is people run businesses. <laughs> you know, no matter <laughs> what business it is, whether it's high, low, or whatever, I used to be quite intimidated by what I perceived as people that were high in corporate. And, you know, I used to feel less than or whatever. Until over the years, I've realized I've never met one person that doesn't have their own stuff going on <laughs> in one way, shape, or form. We're, we're so, mad. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're on that. So tell me, how do you, what kind of processes do you use to market that business? Like, how do you go about trying to market that? Because I know, again, people have had, you know, similar experiences to yourself or they can relate to some areas of it. 
But, you know, kudos, you have got back up, you've jumped back up, you're taking on a new thing. But then it's like, nobody knows me as this thing. So how do you go and market yourself around that? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of my initial growth just came from reaching out to business people that I rub shoulders with in one my shape or form over the years and, and picked yeah. up a lot of referral through that as well. Because, you know, I'd work with business owners that, that saw the impact that I had from, I guess, the financial management perspective working with them. Yeah. Uh, and then when when they realised that this is this is now what I do and I'm and I'm and I'm actually found a place that I that I love working in now. And this this is that was a go back to the old financial planning life. I, it was it was one of those things I was good at, but I, I actually didn't really get a kick out of it. It, it yeah. wasn't it didn't float my boat. It was kind of just paint by numbers going through the process. Pay paid the bills. Yeah, exactly. But now yeah. it's actually passionate to sit down and go, okay, let's have a look at the business now. Where are we in six months, twelve months, eighteen months? And some of these clients now I've been working with for you know coming up to two two and a half years with a couple of clients. So there's there's that growth. You're seeing them that their their um, their actual profit. So this is another thing as well. It's teaching business owners that um, the turnover isn't the yardstick. You know, measuring oh we've got a multi million dollar turnover. Yeah. Fantastic. You got a two million dollar turnover and your profit's thirty thousand dollars. There's something wrong in your business. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. we've got to get change their mindset to look at what's the profitability in their business. And so sometimes it's a whole education process just to get them to understand what are the metrics that they really should be taking note of in their own business mm. and pull the levers necessary to improve them. Yeah. And quite often it is that like business owners sometimes go into a business because they're good at whatever the task is or the product is. But they're not necessarily good at all those benchmarks and figures. So it's a big deep dive and learning process for sure. Absolutely. Um, I know that you um, have seen from what you've seen, and I know you've started doing it a little bit yourself, although you did resist it. Um, how, how do you find that video becomes part of or an integral part of marketing in today's market? Oh, look, it's, it's, and, and look, you know, this, that I know Andrew probably didn't finish answering your previous question. It, it's, it's that transition mm -hmm. now to moving into those social media spaces and the YouTubes and the, and the word of mouth and just having a, um, you know, literally having a, a website or a funnel where someone can, can catch, capture what it is, you know, have a look at what it is that you do and, and follow your journey and go, well, oh, hang on, I think I, this person resonates with me. I'd like to know more. Uh, but moving into that space now and did the whole digital marketing aspect is uh, is a place that's a it's a new it's a new um, hat for me I suppose that then I'm wearing yeah. this hat at the moment to go uh, and, I, and it's a baptism of fire like I'm learning so much each week and yeah you're right there was definitely some resistance to to begin with um, and it was it I don't really know why maybe. Um, just stuck in my ways doing something for so long a certain ways that this new thing took me a bit of time to get my head around and mm. now now i'm um, going from strength to strength with it and i know when you did it and this i think is a prime example people believe they haven't got enough time or they're not techie or they're not whatever and yet like any project really when you stop and just focus and do it it's so much easier than you actually yeah. thought it was. It's I find it's the build up of whatever it is is the the big boogeyman rather than the actual thing. When you stop it, break down the task and do it, it's actually really easy compared to what you thought it was. Yeah, and look, it's it's no secret that you know working with yourself and Sarah, you guys just literally have broken things down chunk by chunk by chunk. And if you just keep doing it, this week I've just got to do chunk A. Next week chunk B. Next yeah. week chunk C. And a month down the track, you go holy crap, I've got this video and it works. And so yeah. it's follow, the, follow the system, follow the process. The other thing I'd say was, was particularly for myself being, you know, in that busy nature, it was realising that I actually need to prioritise this and schedule some time and put some, you know, bank some time against it. So when I got to that particular time in the week where I've scheduled that time, I worked on that project. I didn't let yeah. the other distractions come about. I go, no, no, this was time to work on my, you know, my marketing message, working on my, um, my video presentation, put my script together, actually shoot, you know, do the voiceover, yeah. then put all the, you know, the, the video work together and then have a polished product. So by scheduling in that time each week, then I got to the Yeah, outcome. I love that you brought that up because it's a thing I've learned. Um, it's a learned behaviour, not a natural one. Mm -hmm. You and I are quite alike as in bright, shiny syndrome. You know, don't let me get anything. I want to do this, this, this. 
what I have found. And look, there's always a bit of flexibility. I have learned to build in some flexibility, but I live by my calendar now. My partner quite often laughs and he goes, if I'm not in the calendar, I don't get in. And it's almost true because, you know, I say, right, well, he comes, my partner works away. So he'll come home and it's like, right, what do you do that weekend? So I'll block it out so that we can do it. But um, again, in that wheel of life, because that's important to me. But when I have a blocked out that that's time for video creating or that's time for marketing or that's time for planning, whatever it is, I will do it then. And if not, because, you know, sometimes life happens, it goes top priority for the next day and it has to fit in. Yeah, that's the that's the you know, you, you, when you develop those systems of doing a, an end of day sweep, you know, what were the things I was yeah. supposed to do today? And, and, you know, for whatever life event that came up and you didn't get it done, you've now got to go, well, hang on, that still needs to get done. I best I prioritise that into tomorrow or the day after or wherever you can in the immediate future to then yeah. be able at the end of the week, take that off. And so by doing yeah. that daily sweep and then that weekly sweep as well, you really have that opportunity to pretty much most things don't fall through the cracks anymore. Yeah, I, I've learned to actually I have <laughs> it printed out in front of me where I have a schedule in terms of, you know, up at this time, exercise, blah, blah. And I have just blocks out like that so that I can't because my tendency is I'll just go to the shops. I'm at home. Who have I got to answer to? There's nobody here. <laughs> um, it can be kind of dangerous. But yeah, definitely routine, routine, routine. So one of the questions we've almost come to the end that I always love asking my guests at the very end is, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing instead? Pole dancer. Ah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> ah, you crack me up all the time. I've, um, I've, always, I've always thought reverse stripper. Like I go out on stage naked and people pay me money to put my clothes back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've upgraded to pole dancer. Yeah. Um, uh, are you a good dancer? No. No. Okay. All right. That's not good. I don't know. I, I, uh, maybe. That's okay. Maybe. <laughs> that's all right. Dave, it has been an absolute pleasure to have a chat with you today. And I'm sure we can come back and do some more interviews later because there's there's lots of pockets of stuff that we could actually delve down in. So um, it's I, I'm really, really grateful for you being so open and honest. And um, so for today, we're going to say goodbye, but we will see you again soon. So guys, it's bye from me. Thanks very much. Take care.